Hello uh, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today at Getting the Balance Right, the Agency of AI. I'm very excited. We're going to talk about my favorite topic, artificial intelligence. My name is Mark Midovich, Global Mark. I'm coming to you live today from Mexico, Mexico, Cancun, Mexico, where I'm also involved in other conferences and other programs. But it is a delight to be at Horace's global event today. It is just exciting to talk about this issue of getting decisions right and uh, AI affected by cultures, interest, and data, everything that we put in our algorithms, and um, what we could do to give AI another life, or AI has another life already. Is it bounded? Is it uh, uh, boundless? What are the tasks? Um, is AI ahead of human beings in terms of creativity? Uh, we are going to discuss all of this. And uh, today, I'd like to welcome a special uh, panelists and guests that have joined me today. Uh, it is Sheldon Fernandez, the CEO of Darwin AI from Toronto, Canada. Welcome. Igor Yablakov, CEO of Prion, North Carolina, United States. Frida Poli, the CEO and co-founder of Pymetrics, New York, United States. And Sideris Paroda, uh, CEO and co-founder of Shelf.io. Uh, out of New York. So we have a lot of New Yorkers uh, today, and we have a Canadian, and we might be lucky and have someone else joining us today during the live session. In any case, we're going to begin the discussion. Um, I would like to first introduce an um, uh, interesting concept, marrying the concept of creativity and the future of work. Uh, humans and machines converged, united, here is what's happening according to the World Economic Forum data. 133 new million jobs may emerge that are adopted to the new division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms, which are going to involve creativity, basic tasks, um, very advanced tasks. Uh, $2.9 trillion uh, is going to be allocated in business value uh, in workers' productivity and AI augmentation. And most likely, 52% of tasks, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, is going to be performed by machines by 2025, compared to 29% in just 2019, pre-pandemic time. So as we are exploring all of those interesting concepts and topics today, I want to start the conversation about AGI and get this uh, part of the conversation moving forward with our distinguished panelists. Is there AGI or is there a concept? People are talking about human level AI uh, as a useful goal, uh, but even how is it possible when humans are specialized themselves? How do you reach uh, that? The research community believes that there is some progress that is made towards um, AGI. Uh, scaling up, of course, helps. Sequences of tokenized inputs uh, is certainly happening. We see that many things are around the corner. Uh, we see that generalized self-supervised learning is around the corner. We see explicit simple manipulation, which is critically important. We see gradient-based learning, which is part of the solution. We don't know how many of those concepts are needed. We don't understand the most obvious ones, and we can't predict how long it will take to reach us. Simply, we can't. We still don't have a learning paradigm today that allows machines to learn how the world works. And like humans and many non-human babies do. So there is a clear separation right now of the carbon uh, and uh, carbon species and silicon species. What we need to understand and what it would be important to understand is how to observe, the, how machines could observe like babies. Learn to predict the, how one could influence the world through taking actions. Learn hierarchical representation allows long-term predictions. Properly deal with the facts of the world that are not completely predictable. Enable agents to predict sequences of actions. Enable machines to plan hierarchically, decomposing complex tasks in subtasks. All of that is possible, maybe, if we improve gradient-based learning and other means. I want to get comments. Uh, I want to get comments from Sheldon. What's your opinion uh, regarding uh, this topic that I just mentioned, human level or general AI? Yeah, it's, uh, and thank you for the, the context uh, you provided there, Mark. Um, I think one of the great joys of my kind of adventure with Darwin AI is four months after starting Darwin, my wife got pregnant with her first child. 
it's the often joke that I have, you know, two, two startups, so to speak, an artificial intelligence startup and a biological intelligence startup. And it's been interesting to see them both co-evolve in the same way. You know, I think uh, one of the distinctions that, you know, is important uh, for me, and I, and I got this from a book by U of, U of T professor named Brian Cantwell Smith. Uh, he wrote a book called The Promise of Artificial Intelligence, Reckoning and Judgment. And he makes the distinction between registering the world and reckoning with the world. And he says, you know, what machine learning and advanced forms of artificial intelligence are really good at today is coming to some quantitative interpretation of the signals around them, you know, classifying something as whether or not it's a, a you know, a cat or, or a specific, you know, type of class. But where, where we learn as human beings is engaging the world as the world, reckoning with the world. And um, I think that's a dichotomy that, you know, we'll have to figure out how to scale to achieve true AGI, so to speak. You know, I think of, uh, I was, when I, wrote, when I read this book, my son was eight months old. So this was a while back. And he was just taking a, a, a toy giraffe and putting it repeatedly on the couch and watching it fall. And if you think about what he's learning there about gravity and objects and irregular, you know, you know, different types of manipulations, that's how we learn as human beings is really being an active participant in the world. We have to figure out how we really do that with AI in, a, in an authentic way to get, I think, Mark, to, you know, the AGI that, that you allude to. Um, Thank you so, very much, Sheldon. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention for the benefit of our audience, Sheldon not only is the CEO of Darwin AI, but Sheldon is an accomplished author and speaker, had uh, spoken at a number of conferences, including Singularity University, MIT Technology Conferences recently, and much more, has written a number of technical books and articles, and had uh, many exciting uh, things in his entrepreneurial endeavors and his careers, and is very passionate to change the trajectory and direction and provide something positive of artificial intelligence. And we thank Sheldon for being with us. I want to go now next to Igor Yablikov. Igor Yablikov, uh, thank you very much uh, for being part of it. Uh, Igor is the CEO of Prime, an artificial intelligence startup that is innovating how businesses interface with decisions, knowledge, and workflows. He's named as an industry luminary by Speech and Technology Magazine. He has previously founded industry pioneer Yap, the world's first high-accuracy, fully automated cloud platform for voice recognitions. After the products were deployed by the dozens of enterprises, the company became Amazon's first AI-related acquisitions. The firm's uh, inventions have served Nucleus and a number of other products that came out. Amazon, Alexa, Echo, Fire TV. He has worked at IBM. He has been awarded a Eisenhower and Truman National Security Fellowships and much more. He has been an innovator in human language technologies and positioning up educational opportunities for them. So um, uh, coming to you, uh, Igor, tell us a little bit about the framework that I introduced about AGI. What's your impression uh, analysis? Where do we go from here? Is that realistic? Is it possible? And um, um, we'll look forward to your comments. Yeah, I like the way that you stated uh, about creativity, right? Because I think, uh, you know, many of us remember the line uh, that Steve Jobs uttered where computers were the bicycles for the mind. And so AI is going to be uh, a race car and quantum backed AI is, is going to be a rocket ship. Uh, so I think a lot of us have a hopeful uh, vision for that future. The problem is, you know, the natural law is that we have a normal distribution curve. You know, how many of us sputter and mutter uh, profanities under our breath when we have to log into systems with two factor authentication and things like that, wondering who's misusing these tools? Right. Because we many of us are, you know, you know, grew, grew up through academia and, 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 you know, potentially worked in government agencies and the like in the dawn of the Internet and the dawn of the Web when there were only good actors on, on, on these systems as well. And it was an open aperture. So when we think about these tools, right, we have to obviously know that we're creating these hammers. Right. And you put this hammer in. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter's hand, and he's going to uh, build Habitat for Humanity, and you put it in Ted Bundy's uh, hand, and you're going to get a dead body, right? So these, uh, at the same time, when we talk about AGI, it's, I don't know what everybody's expecting. Is it some sort of Hollywood vision of of this godlike uh, entity, or is it going to be the equivalent of a high school student? You know, you're not going to let a high school student, you know, at graduation practice law perform surgery, <laughs> design nuclear power plants and things of that sort. So you may end up, you know, getting this entity that 
that can uh, do some basic tasks and things of that sort. But guess what? It may be missing the equivalent of a prefrontal cortex to know what's good uh, and, and what's bad. And, and, and so there may be limited use and, and we still will be turning to vertically oriented uh, AIs to actually perform more uh, concrete tasks because we have to regulate and watch what they're doing and measure what they're doing as well. So those are some of my early thoughts on this. Thank you very much, Igor. Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot more to tell. We are limited on time today. We have a lot mm -hmm. of things to cover. So very much appreciate your comments. I want to go next to Frida. Uh, Frida Poli is an award-winning uh, Harvard and MIT neuroscientist who has turned entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, a CEO and a co-founder of uh, Pymetrics a soft skills platform that uses behavioral science and AI to make unbiased workforce decisions more accurate. She was named one of the Inc.'s top 100 female founders and entrepreneurs, top 100 most powerful women with the global clients, including Blackstone and others that matched millions of people with ideal jobs to help everyone realize their true potential at work. Thank you very much. We welcome you to this program. What's your you. take on uh, general AI and, um, you know, is it real, yeah. is it feasible, how long? Get get a sense from you uh, being yeah, in the market um, and focusing on that. Thank you. Happy to answer very briefly. This is far, far outside of my area of expertise. Um, the only thing I can speak to on this is that, you know, as a cognitive scientist uh, that has spent, you know, 10 years at Harvard and MIT prior to my current job, um, you know, I think most of the data to date um, indicate that, you know, even when we're talking about um, you know, sort of more generalized forms of intelligence, learning how to play, uh, you know, games or, you know, beat people at certain sort of prescribed tasks, those are environments where the rules are quite obvious and clear. Um, and so I think that, you know, the human brain um, is, is excellent at uh, environments where there's a lot of ambiguity. Um, and I think that to really be successful in creating AGI, you'd have to be confident that machine learning can work as well as the human brain in, in context of ambiguity. I just don't know that we have that data. Most of the most of the data we have on um, on AGI is really, you know, uh, you know, computers <laughs> performing better on tasks where where the rules are quite clear and delineated. So that's my very non expert opinion on that. And that's probably all I have to say, because it's not. Rito, thank you very much. I want to follow up on certain things where you have a deep expertise. And then sure. uh, we go to uh, patiently waiting Sidarius and some of the things that he has to say. But I want to follow up with you, the work that you're doing on sure. a workforce, on talents, on talent management and skills assessment. Uh, where does this fit in? Where are we right now in terms of utilizing AI and technology to yep. improve uh, the workforce uh, yep. uh, in the United States and globally around the world at uh, yep. the internal mobility? Now uh, we're in the era of great resignations. People are mm -hmm. resigning for different reasons. How do we keep them engaged? How do we mm -hmm. pick them? What, how do we leverage AI yeah. uh, for this incredible thing that we know as brain power and talent? Yeah. So look, I mean, I think that there is clear cut evidence. Actually, there was an academic paper that just came out um, in the last month, you know, showing that um, well-developed AI that is, you know, tested for biases, un un unwanted biases and so forth, performs far better um, than human decision making when it comes to making any type of workforce decision. And the data are very clear on this. Right. I think the challenge uh, is that the public, uh, you know, whether it's recruiters or, you know, the media or whatever, are still quite skeptical and have a very skeptical opinion. So I think the biggest challenge we have is not that the technology doesn't work. It's really, you know, convincing the humans that have to purchase the technology um, that that is not to be feared. And I think, you know, it goes back to, you know, when the steam engine first came out, women were advised not to ride on, on trains because, you know, they went so fast that women's uteruses could fly out of their bodies, right? And I think we're a little bit in that stage still um, when it comes to more widespread adoption, not just in HR, but in all fields of sort of um, narrow AI where, you know, it's clear the data support the idea that, you know, the tools are working much better than, than humans, but there's still a lot of resistance and skepticism for a whole variety of reasons, so. Thank you very much. I yep. want to go to Sidarius Parota, who is CEO and co-founder of the company Shelf AI uh, IO, which raised $16 million to provide fast, accurate answers to questions in block business success. He has worked on a number of applications and adoption of AI for at least 12 years or more, has served as uh, the U.S. Peace Corps and has contributed to organizations like the World Bank, 
the Harvard Business School, MIT, and others. We're going to now, uh, again, feel free to jump in on AGI, but I also want to discuss with you the practical things uh, that we could do and what's happening to adopt AI within the enterprise. Why are we not seeing this full adoption uh, at, uh, at, at the organization? So coming along, the great to have a discussion in AGI, but then we want to put uh, AI to use, practically speaking, within an enterprise but how do you get started uh, in uh, in the implementation and what are the steps for the adoption at the CEO and board level? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, it is interesting, uh, especially for uh, CEOs who are, are running businesses selling AI. Uh, I think that we can attest that the market is a bit battle scarred at the moment. Uh, there was a statistic by Gartner that 85% of AI projects fail. And I feel that when I'm talking to customers and prospects all the time. Uh, I'm going to try to answer two questions. So let's see, let's see how, I, how I can weave these together, because I think the next point kind of speaks to both the general AI and how to practically apply AI. And that is taking a longer-term perspective. So there was another statistic, and this was by McKenzie, that currently only 1% of an organization's data is being analyzed. Yet that 1% contributes to 10% of the total global digital economy. So that is $1 trillion a year. And that's 1% now. I think we've all seen incredible progress over the last three to four years, almost phenomenal, almost un unfathomable progress where AI is being used in applications in every single facet of society from predicting famine successfully to solving uh, brain injuries. And I would love to get your take on BMI, Frida, because that is a very fascinating field and the stuff being done, not only with Elon Musk's technology, but, but many, many others. Um, but a, a brain, a machine interface or a brain computer interface, that's what I was referring to. But, but anyway, so, so you have 1% uh, currently and it's already phenomenal what is being done. And it's incredible how much progress I'm sure all of our companies have been making just in the last year. So what does 2% look like when it, what, when it becomes 20% of the global economy? 4%, 40%, 8% of all the data. Only 8% near 80% until there's a point where it consumes everything. It consumes the entire global economy feeds is consumed by automation and AI related function. So obviously there is a convergence there of technologies. Nanotechnology is gonna connect with, with neurotechnology, which is gonna connect with AI, which is gonna connect with robotics. And there, there is this general convergence taking place that quite honestly, I don't think anyone can predict accurately. Ben might be might have been one of the, the leading people that is predicting that, then him and Ray Kurzweil, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's very, very hard to predict because it is so vast in probabilities and, and, and potential for accurate uh, understanding. But what is very clear is over time, more and more things are going to converge and more and more opportunities are going to be created in AI. And actually, I would say in the short term, there is a, a massive opportunity for anyone to be involved in this field. Uh, I don't care about the education level. I don't care where you're located, what your skill set is. There is a, an infinite range of opportunities for people to participate in this and, and engage in companies like ours or in government organizations or in nonprofits or whatever, and uh, be part of something that is co constantly improving and evolving versus being on the sideline and, and having it kind of be something that you would watch in fear. So anyway, that, that's kind of my take on the AGI. I, 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 think, I think there's an in, inevitability about it. I think nobody can predict the, the, the timing of it. It is truly one of the most exciting times to be a, a human. Also, one of, uh, there, there is some unknowns about what that means as, it, as everything starts to merge. And the timeline <laughs> around that, nobody knows. Is it 10 years, 20 years? There's dates of 2030, 2045. Nobody really knows. But clearly, change is ahead. And I think that the world that currently exists will be unrecognizable from the future only 20 years away, like unrecognizable. Nothing is going to be the same. So that could be very exciting. And I think it's a, it's also a, 
a jumping off point into how do you apply this? How do you get started? Because I, I would make a case that everybody on earth should participate. Uh, everyone should be part of this movement because it's the biggest movement in human history, in, our, in the history of our species. So that's pretty exciting, I'd say. Um, and then I'll say some quick practical things and I'll shut up. Um, I, I'd say that the practical thing about starting is to start small. Uh, get, get yourself up to speed as quickly as possible. doesn't matter your skill set, again, your educational background or whatever. Uh, but get yourself up to speed and then start a project and get, get a stakeholder group and brainstorm a whole bunch of things that you can do for your organization to just get started with AI. And once you get that big list of stuff, pick the easiest, smallest thing that you're already measuring the metrics so that you know already whether it's working or not and don't be necessarily connected to an outcome everyone wants it to work and that's why there's been so many failures because there's there's this big hype bubble around ai which i understand because companies are promoting more than they can actually deliver uh because of all the funding environment and, and something else but nevertheless the undercurrents of what are happening are true and it is fun it's transforma it's transformational and that you should get started with a project and you should start and you should start flexing that muscle of applying AI in your organization and do it slowly, quarter by quarter. And that's how every organization from Google to Amazon did it until they became leaders in it. But you don't necessarily be a, need to be a leader. You just need to be a contributor. So thank you very much. I know there's a lot to tell. I'm just mindful of the time. Yep. And we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of interesting uh, feedback and uh, also insights from uh, the panel so we thank you for that convert the model of the convergence participation contribution and ai and uh, taking ai to the next level by actually building and showing use cases deploying them and um and getting the adoption moving in organizations i want to jump now to sheldon sheldon you are really personifying the issue of trust uh the issue of trust um on um uh, with ai globally with uh, some mission critical systems Uh, but in order for that uh, to become a uh, reality, we need to understand what's behind it, you know, what's behind some of those decisions. Uh, uh, a lot of the work uh, that you have done and also what you focused privately on is looking at emotions, looking at uh, quintessential emotions of the human beings and understanding how all of this is proliferated within AI, such as forgiveness, such as redemption. Um, So can AI, uh, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of explainability and importance of trust, uh, fairness, and all of those things that are, have to be embedded and we have to get a clear picture on what's happening. Also, how could we tell uh, based on um, uh, algorithm and based on uh, responses, based on output, on emotions, uh, sentiment emotions uh, that are, we are seeing in some of the uh, work uh, solutions in AI and some of the research? So I'll leave it to you kind of to give us a description of what's critically important here and how the system works and what we could do to improve. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot there, Mark. Uh, you know, first of all, on the explainability problem, which will be familiar to many of the listeners, you know, the challenge that we have with second wave machine learning is that these systems learn by looking at tremendous amounts of data. And even the people that design these systems don't necessarily understand how they, you know, internally codify that understanding to reach meaningful conclusions. Uh, the example I often point to is in the early days of Darwin, we had an autonomous vehicle client that ran into a strange situation where their car would turn left with increasing statistical frequency when the color of the sky was a certain shade of purple, right? So just think about that. You know, the, the, the color of the sky is this shade of purple. The car starts turning left. And it turned out after, you know, months of painful debugging that they had done the training for this particular turning scenario in the Nevada desert wow. when the color of the sky was that shade of purple. And that's the only time they had done it. Crazy. Right? So, the, so the whole problem with explainability is we don't know how something works. We don't know when it'll fail. And if you don't know when it'll fail, there are all these edge cases that are lurking in the system waiting to manifest themselves with potentially devastating consequences. So at Darwin, we created technology through the University of Waterloo and our academic team to try to illuminate this black box and give people some understanding as to why the AI is doing what it's doing. Uh, as an example of that, in the early days of the pandemic, we created a neural network called COVIDnet that diagnosed corona based on chest X-rays and CT scans, and we open sourced it to the entire community, and it was used in dozens of hospitals around the world. But a key element of that was 
surfacing to the clinician or the radiologist, this is why I'm diagnosing this particular CT scan as uh, pneumonia and not COVID. And that type of um, info was really important in getting the human buy-in that they were augmenting the AI, not being replaced by it, right? So what we often say is that if you want the human being and the AI to work in concert and get the benefits of both the human understanding and the intuitiveness, but then the hard crunching of data by the artificial intelligence, you need that trust between both actors. You need the human being to trust that the AI has reached a conclusion in a meaningful way. And that's one of the key things that we're working on. And that trust is an emotional concept for many human beings, right? How, how, how and when am I going to trust something? That is something that an AI doesn't necessarily understand, you know, the reason why you, you, you would be inclined to trust something. So we, so to the extent that we've, you know, worked on this problem in a technical way, we, we had done deep technical work in this. We actually discovered that when we deploy these systems into the real world, be it healthcare or manufacturing or what have you, it's the human operator that you have to get on the side of the AI. And that is as much a human emotional endeavor, a psychological endeavor as it is a technical question. Um, so to the point that we're going to have, and you know, I, I love the point that was made about the world will look unrecognizable in 20 years. You know, I'm actually speaking to you from my parents' basement where I grew up as a teenager because they take care of my son during COVID. And, you know, 20 years ago, I was on bulletin board services. You guys might remember them, phone lines and so forth. Yes. We didn't know then that these little ones and zeros traveling or telephone wires were going to completely reimagine industries. And I think the same thing is true of where we are with artificial intelligence in general. We're in this period of adolescence of where the internet was in 1994, and we're just seeing the, the potential applications. So we certainly believe as an organization, this idea of trust is central to the proliferation of AI. And it's a problem that we're deeply committed to because the transformation that's going to result uh, in the application of AI is going to be profound. Um, so I'll pause there and stop there. Thank you, Don, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheldon, for sharing this with us. Clearly, uh, you know, the world is being reimagined with AI. No one could have predicted what we are seeing now uh, over 20 years ago. You mentioned bulletin boards. You mentioned, you know, you know, having all computers. I remember Commodore 64 and, and doing some uh, some programs uh, if and, and then decision loops. All of this is going to be, become today. And also the, how critically important it is to trust the systems to make sure we have trusted data and we have a trusted process uh, underneath it. So thank you for giving us that explanation. I want to go to Igor to take this a little bit further. Uh, Igor, you spend a lot of work on looking at different risks uh, of AI and trying to see how do you mitigate those risks, uh, whether they're real or perceived, uh, and uh, how could those risks, when the risks are mitigated, uh, how do we do it, and how do we then bring AI into the organizations in the most successful way with significant impact. It's all about impact. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's really about impact, what we're doing, the value that we're generating for business, the value that we're generating uh, for uh, society, for citizens. So tell us a little bit about your process and what leaders could do, not, all, not only all of us, the people that are in the enterprise, the people in the public sector, what could they do to mitigate and address the risks and push AI into their organizations? You know, when, whenever we bring up the topic of explain, explainability, I always have a chuckle in, in, in my head because we can't ex even explain why grown men wear little furry outfits and horns on their heads and, and climb Capitol buildings, uh, let alone other other creations as well. So um, it's it's just just keeping it keeping it real. Now, to, to your point, how do organizations mitigate risk when they adopt these technologies is because they don't even think of them as, as uh, technologies, right? I remember, you know, as, as you well mentioned, we were the first speech cloud company, and I was talking myself blue in the face, talking about, wow, look at this user experience. It's, 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 it's going to increase the productivity of all of your uh, downstream customers, and, and it's this great thing. It's going to shorten... Uh, the time time for them to gather this information. We were thinking about voicemail attacks just being a phenomenal uh, experience relative to spending 30 minutes a day manually listening to these things. And, and uh, the carriers were just shrugging their shoulders. But the minute that they discovered that any phone line that had this feature provision churned 50% less, 
from a statistical standpoint, they were buying it in hand over fist and they weren't worried about where's the data, where's it going, where's this happening, where, where's that, that's happening. They just saw that this was a hard number that, that from investors, board and onwards, everybody in the organization essentially lit up and they focused on that. So when I really, when I really think about the evolution of all of our respective companies, you know, in the beginning, we, we almost develop the technology and then we start backing into, well, what's the different use cases for it? And, and I'm sure, you know, similar to ourselves, we have 360 degrees possible of use cases, but we have to find that one landing that we can expand from. And typically that landing has, has a business case. I can tell you, that while all of us are highly interested in things like explainability, reducing risk and things like that, and we're in some ways, um, you know, given given the fact that there really aren't any sort of regulatory guidelines for these things. Look, I talk to military officers that say we just want it to work. You know, we're not really even worried all that much if if something's going to make a left turn in purple skies or not. We just need it to work, especially when you when you see how fast you know they had to react to things like the Ukrainian uh, crisis, um, you know, so to speak. So there's a lot to un- unpack there, but I, th- I think in some ways there, you know, I remember a meeting with the a, a former CEO of Bank of America and he's like, look, I can always out-regulate the regulators because I'll, I can hire these, these people to come in on the commercial side and pay them a lot more, just like, you know, politicians are up and out and become uh, lobbyists. So I think at the end of the day, we're, um, I'm heartened by what um, uh, Europe is doing. Uh, with the draft of the AI Act. I think that's going to be an important movement forward. I think many of us were surprised, I think, in the last couple of days when it was revealed the number of location drops that a typical EU citizen uh, is, is harvested uh, versus a typical American citizen as well. And so, you know, there's going to be macro things that are going to hit and trickle down. And at least we'll we'll know what the basic operating system is for these style of systems, but there, there's always going to be problems with them. Thank you very much, Igor. Igor, I just want to ask you before we go to Frida and, and really deep dive in unpack this ethical AI, responsible AI, where we go, mm-hmm. how does it affect workforce and talent? I want to just maybe just few, um, a minute from your time to differentiate. Uh, you spend also a lot of uh, time thinking about um, there are so many products. You have seen many of them. Uh, uh, whether it's NLP uh, or conversational AI systems or um, knowledge-based products, how do you differentiate? And how do leaders differentiate what's in the market today? Yeah. How do they know uh, which applications and vendors are real uh, and could actually be adopted and the ones that you're going to spend a lot of time and not going to get anywhere, a bridge to nowhere? So I want to get your comments first here. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So enterprise customers, as you well know, they're buying a product and a roadmap. Uh, and I think in some ways there's just a, a, a clustering effect, if you will. So if you get solid references that are willing to talk to them, there always has to be one that's that's ahead of the curve, that's that's willing to experiment uh, together with the organization that that's birthing something. Um, and then and then eventually you get to more conservative buyers that are looking for that for that sort of um, um, uh, essentially highlight. So, so what I would say, it's, it's, it, it's not necessarily anything more exotic than that. You're going to have somebody that wants to promote themselves as a leader in adopting certain styles of technology. And then one who's N, N plus one, one who's N plus two, and then eventually these references build up. Um, but u- ultimately, I'll go back to my previous comments. They're going to make a decision based on a spreadsheet. If you can show up and show, hey, you're getting charged, you know, five or ten percent of this ROI that we were able to work with your team, you know, to predict. They'll they'll sink their teeth into it, because mo- most of us don't want to stay in the innovation center ghetto, because it's not it's not a line of business, you know, it's not it's not moving the you know a couple of the numbers that the organization uh, cares. And I think all of us could do well by saying, would a CEO of a fortune 500 care about this project or not if the answer is no you're working on the wrong use case thank you very much igor for your guidance over the years you obviously amassed a lot of information and knowledge uh frida i want to go to you uh both sheldon and igor have alluded to the critical issue of the regulations taking place right now predominantly in european union 
Um, there is a guideline, a draft that came out from UNESCO uh, and uh, had some privilege to contribute and involved, be involved in some of that. Uh, what, what's your, can you give us an overview of why responsible and ethical AI is critically important today? Yeah, and, uh, as speci- and specifically in your, in your work on using ethical AI uh, to reduce hiring biases, to make sure that we have an inclusive team, uh, a diverse team, uh, of people that could work on various initiatives and projects and contribute to the major success. Uh, there's been a major study that was done by BCG that basically contributed and written a, a lot about it, that uh, diversity and inclusiveness contributes to major success and outcomes of AI platforms and systems, especially the scale of those systems. So we look forward to your guidance here uh, on this particular topic. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, I agree with, um, you know, the fact that, for example, like the U.S. government uh, may be less concerned with explainability and, and things of that nature. And we have government clients and, and I don't disagree with that, but I think that's more of a command and control structure. I think when you're going into, you know, corporate America um, and especially if your platform is being used, I mean, we don't typically have a problem convincing executives that what we do is is superior to what they're doing now. I think when you know, the challenges occur when it's sort of, you know, the hiring manager, the recruiter, sort of, you know, that middle level person that has to interact with the system. That's really when a lot of the issues around explainability and whatnot um, come up. And quite frankly, I think, you know, for the type of AI we do, I think it's it's not difficult to provide that explainability layer. Um, and I agree with whoever said, you know, uh, <laughs> men can't explain why they get into furry costumes and, and all the rest of it. Completely agree. But I do think that, you know, we can actually that's part of the beauty of artificial intelligence from our perspective is that you can provide um, the explanation for why a decision was made. And, and that is actually, um, you know, sort of superior. So from our perspective, I think, you know, transparency, um, you know, is part of responsible AI, transparency and uh, and explainability. Again, not always for all use cases, but certainly for the use case that, you know, we, we live in. Um, and, you know, and I think that we're taking steps in the right direction. One of the concerns I have is that, and this is sort of true in the, in the EU um, situation, there's a lot of focus on process audits as opposed to outcome audits. And I think outcome audits at the end are far more Um, critical than process audits. What I mean by that is like, you know, if you take cars and emission standards, like you don't need to understand every element of a car's engine to know whether it emitted a certain level of carbon dioxide. And I think at the end of the day, from our perspective, for what we do, we really want to focus much more on sort of what is the actual outcome on, you know, hiring and diversity and inclusion than sort of like what was every single um, you know, decision made in, in, in the making of this artificial intelligence system. So those are my thoughts on responsible AI and governance. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know we don't have as much time, but I want to um, focus on the future. Uh, where is AI taking us uh, now? We are in a very difficult, volatile 2022. We have an upcoming recession. Uh, we have hyperinflation. Uh, we have a uh, political crisis. We have a um, uh, crisis right now uh, in uh, Europe, in Eastern Europe right now. And there is um, really uh, challenges right now of our supply chain uh, globally, uh, China today, but many other places and cities are affected. What could we take in terms of this opportunities that AI is offering us together with uh, humans, the converged effort? What could we do? I start with you, uh, the first scenarios to give us maybe uh, a little bit of thinking of, so we don't make the same mistakes again and again. And we leverage AI, um, not that we could solve the recession crisis coming up, but at least maybe we could do a soft landing. Give us a glimpse of what's possible right now, now and into the future. Oh, boy. Uh, it brought me to have a positive view of it. Um, yes, positive. But the, of course, we want our uh, audience yeah. to be cheerful. I'm going to try to stretch my mind as best as I can. Uh, I'll just I'll just be analytical and honest, and, and then you can pull the positivity or negativity however you like. Um, I believe AI is an accelerator of whatever is going on. So whatever condition exists, um, it, it's a snowball going down from Mount Everest at this point. There's a huge momentum there, and there's... Obviously, there's automation that's part of it, and there are many human social issues that are part of that 
which we haven't necessarily worked out and figured out as a global community. So do I believe that AI is a solution for, and again, I would contextualize this as short-term problems that humanity are going through uh, from a social standpoint. I'm not sure it can do that until we get through those social issues and figure out how we're defining. I, I think people talked about the regulations and there's obviously the, the, the elephant in the room in China that has a, a much more aggressive strategy on AI and uh, is accelerating faster than any company or country on earth um, in a focused way. But I, I guess my summary of, of the situation would be it, it is independent of the forces and an accelerator of whatever is happening. Thank you very much. I want to go to Dar uh, I want to go to you, Sheldon, uh, for um, a similar um, uh, question. Future centric approach again, knowing that we have some immediate issues right now that we have to deal around the world, and also many bright things that are happening right now: AI and and and, and biological connection, AI and quantum, uh, AI and meta. Where where is AI moving into direction, and um, what do leaders need to watch out as we are um, uh, in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I'm going to try to strike a similar conciliatory note as as my colleague. Um, you know, I often say AI, AI, like anything, is a tool, a very powerful tool, no better or worse than the men or women that are that are leveraging it. Um, but I think we're going to see some profound uh, innovation uh, as a result of the the tools that we have in front of us. You know, if you look at, for example, what DeepMind has done with protein folding and some of these really fundamental strides that we that, that we are taking with you know foundational ai um i think there's a lot of optimism as to what we can achieve with the natural sciences and physical sciences in the next 10 to 20 years um i think that is very much the optimistic tone that you know that i want to point to is that some of the fundamental innovation that we're seeing uh not just with DeepMind but similar companies like so some of the ones here um, are going to radically change the way that we do certain things and, um, you know, the innovations that, that we can uncover. Um, you know, I, and I think, the, I think the one point to keep in mind is this also extend to very mundane use cases that don't seem as eye-catching when you hear about them, but can have profound effects. Uh, for example, I was at a panel, I was chairing a panel at MIT, uh, you know, uh, what was it, a month ago, and I was speaking to the head of sustainability for Honeywell, who was saying 38% of all carbon emissions come from physical buildings, office buildings that people uh, are a part of. And so just a little bit of innovation there can move the needle with respect to climate change significantly. And so if we look at some of the innovations in that particular area and the effect it can have on the planet, those are also going to be quite substantial. So I think, you know, I would point to the way AI is going to allow for some of these innovations as the optimistic note, given all the, the whirlwind of challenge we have uh, in front of us that you've alluded to, Mark, um, at the same time. Thank you very much, Sheldon. We're a little bit overdue, but I want to get uh, a closing and future thinking from you, Frida, and then Igor, uh, Frida. Uh, I want to take a view from you on what's going to be happening with AI and the future of workforce human-centric society, where are we going with this? What do we need to do with training? Give us give us your perspective. Absolutely. I mean, look, I think there are so many challenges in the workforce right now that are centered around uh, matching problems, right? And how do we fix those matching problems? We are not going to fix those matching problems using um, humans because it's not scalable and they can't do the matching nearly as accurately. And so if you look at all of the labor market challenges that we're facing right now, it's all really about finding the right fit between a person and a role. And I think only AI can really do that efficiently and in a way that is far more accurate. So that's my hope. And I think that, you know, some of these challenges that we're facing in terms of adoption are, are you know, those barriers are coming down as people really realize the need for something that works far more efficiently and accurately than the human process. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. now finally, we're going for this closing mm -hmm. and impactful closing from Igor. Um, you've been focused your career on knowledge, uh, making sure that knowledge is open, it's transparent, it's inclusive. Where are we going with this with AI? Um, you know, what's our potential uh, into the future? Well, DeepMind and, and uh, OpenAI don't do any of us favors when they're constant drama llamas panicking everybody. Um, but but I will say, I believe more uh, the, the rollout of augmented intelligence uh, this decade. And I think in the same way that we know that as we have life transitions, as as uh, 
as families uh, birth children, you know, people graduate college uh, and, and the like. The, these macroeconomic shocks to the system do spur uh, uh, innovation. And, and I think we're going to see an acceleration of, of, of some of these things, just like a, a lot of the things that we're now taking for granted came after t- the 2008. It wasn't Sequoia's doom and gloom presentation that essentially put an ice box on innovation. If anything, it, it actually made all the carpetbaggers disappear from 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 our work. Uh, and, and we're and it actually left uh, more resources to the folks that are actually were uh, pushing the ball forward in in uh, in our in our space as well, so uh, very hopeful uh, through these transitions, and it's incumbent for us to increase the aperture of opportunity uh, for folks that aren't going to be doing this day in and day out as practitioners. The pandemic has highlighted that we need people to deliver packages, that we need people in our hospitals, that we need people in all of these varied fields, and all we are is showing up with tools for them to be more effective in their jobs. Um, the world is analog. And, uh, and sometimes we forget about that. Thank you, Igor. And I think um, focusing on the positive note, um, AI ha- offers us significant potential to the future. We haven't touched the surface yet. But the people that are listening to us, that this presentation will be streamed on channels like YouTube. Understand the potential that we are focused on efficiency and effectiveness and optimization. You're just scratching the surface. We could do so much more addressing the UN SDG goals. Right now, the world needs AI to address the most complex societal challenges and problems. And I think we can. We're doing a lot in climate. We're doing a lot in with um, uh, food uh, area, food management supply chain, and we could do a lot more. Let's refocus. Let's see what AI could bring to the future. I want to thank this distinguished panel that is joined from different parts of the world. And um, I wish everybody a successful uh, conference uh, today at Horasis. Uh, we're covering the globe uh, at uh, Horasis, and we're looking at all perspectives, not only AI and technology. And there are many distinguished leaders around uh, the world that are joining. So please continue to participate and listen to the conference. Meanwhile, we're signing off. I'm signing off from Mexico uh, today. And uh, all the best and uh, much success to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.